Good morning. I love it when people get feisty on the platform, don't you? That's why I married Joey. I like feisty. So like Jeremy said, my name is Erica Willis. My husband is Joey. He was the one up here pacing, shouting about the love of God and heaven. And I feel like every time he gets off the platform, he looks at me and he goes, I was just yelling the whole time, wasn't I? And I was like, yes, you were. I love that. That's so good. So I'm so excited to be up here um, as a representative of the women in this church and just as the wife of a pastor. And um, I used to despise those things. And I'm going to share a little bit about that story. But God has brought the full circle of restoration in that in me. So I'm so excited to be here to share my heart with you, what God's heart is for the church and their fruits uh, and our talents that we've been bringing uh, to him uh, in the ways that we serve and we love. But I want to tell you a little bit about my family. Like I said, I'm married to Joey, and we have been married 15 years now. And yeah, he put a ring on it. That's right. I have a son, Tristan. He is 10 years old, and he is every bit of the 10-year-old boy that he was created to be. Mothers know what I'm saying. Uh, And then my daughter, Reese, is seven, and she's the sweetest. And then we are in the process of adopting a brand new baby. It's like that feeling when you're on a roller coaster and you're about to go down the hill and you're like, I might die, but I'm also very excited. That's what adoption feels like. So if you ever wanted to know, there you are. So um, we're basically starting over. I thought I was home free uh, for, of the baby stages and all those things because, um, I mean, I'm, I'm a nurturer, but I'm not really a nurturer. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that today. But I do have a ministry called Believe Boldly that I get to serve in consistently and love on ladies. And then here's the deal. Uh, the guys realize that the girls have a cool thing going. And they're like, can we please join? I'm like, I guess, if you want to be with the cool girls, right? They ask to join. They ask to do things. Um, so we love to pour into people, um, guys, girls, kids, whatever it is that God calls us to and believe boldly. So uh, this series that we are in called First Fruits, uh, it's very important. If you've never heard of First Fruits, if you don't know the concept from the Bible, it's basically telling us that God gives us things, gives us gifts, gives us fruit to help sustain us and do his work in the kingdom. And when that happens, we need to recognize that by giving him some of that back, our first fruits, the first of our crops the first of the things that he's given us, we give back to God. Now, we've specifically spoken about this in the context of kingdom currencies. So they've shared already about different currencies, different ways that we can use and pay into the kingdom of God, ways that we can be trusted as stewards of God's goodness. And when we do that, we can look at our time and how we spend it and say, God, you've given me all these days, all these breaths, all these years in my life. How am I spending them in a way that reflects the heart of God? And then we can also look at the talents that we have. Uh, Jeremy shared a lot about how some of us go to work and our mentality is, I'm here to get a paycheck, I'm here to check in and check out, and then I turn around and leave the church without any of my talents being used there. And the church stands alone, needing more hands and feet to do the work of God. So we've got to evaluate where are we spending these kingdom currencies because sometimes our kingdom currency is, a, is a, an actual treasure, our money, our wallets, our paychecks, and that's a very touchy subject. But like Jeremy said this last week when we were offered a chance to pour into the kingdom to give back our first fruits above and beyond in an offering, you guys came through in an incredible way. And I believe that shows the heart of our church and the way that you are ushering in the goodness of God in the way that you steward these kingdom currencies. Today, we're going to talk about the last two. They are our words and our touch. These are things that God has given us as human beings to come into the world and use these to show the love of Christ. And he says, where are you stewarding these gifts? Who are you giving them to? How are you being trusted with them? Where are you planting good seed? Where are you stepping back from the things that are comfortable for you to step into the goodness that I have when you use tangible words and touch to impact the kingdom? When Jeremy brought this concept to me, I was like, you know what, I'm really glad that you came to me first because I'm basically the expert in words and touch. So uh, really proud to come and represent that on the stage. He knows I'm just a natural mother. I'm natural at loving people selflessly. Uh, I'm fantastic. My mother-in-law laughed loudest. Did you all hear that? (laughs) 
So if we're setting up the moment, you're catching on. This is sarcasm, okay? I am not the best with words and touch and natural mothering, um, but I wanna show you a clip. If you wanted to know what it looks like for me in my life, um, when someone is down and out, when they're having a hard time, um, this is typically how I would respond. Do you even care that I am not feeling well? Of course I do. There. Well, I'd love to stay and do this all night, but one of us has to go to the laugh factory. So I said the only difference between that and real life is that my broom handle would be longer so I can be outside of the room with the germs while padding. That would be the only difference. Because for me, brokenness is the thing that brings Jesus in. And I'm not teaching about words and touch because I'm the expert at it. I'm teaching on it because I'm the most broken by it. It is not something that is natural to me. I'm not the woman who tears up at certain commercials for puppy dogs that need to be adopted. I don't, I don't come running when there's a child that needs help. I'm kind of like, where are your parents? And I wish they would come quickly. <laughs> Cause you got boogers and things. One of the times that I knew this most deep in my heart that the Lord would have to grow in me a heart for nurture was when my son Tristan was about two or, or four or five, and my daughter Reese was just learning to toddle. And we go on a family walk, and it's the three of us, and of course she's running ahead of me, and she's doing her little run, and she falls, I mean, and hits hard. And I stand there, and I look and think, well, is there blood? Is it? And Tristan looks at me and says, at four, what's wrong with you? And then runs and scoops her up and kisses her. And I was like, oh, that, that's my job. That's what I should be doing. <laughs> Our words and touch are powerful gifts that have the power for good and the power for bad. Now let's be clear, words and touch often are defined very narrowly. And I want you to realize that our words aren't always what we speak. It's sometimes what we write. It's sometimes the way we speak with our body language. And touch is the concept of coming so close to something that you actually make a connection with it. We know that words are important to God. He spoke creation into being, like Joey said earlier. His Bible, his instructions for us while on earth are in written form. He is the word that became flesh. We, Paul says, are a testimony written on human hearts. Words are important to God. And so is touch. Did you know that God could have stayed in heaven and righted all wrongs with Jesus dying on a cross in some heavenly realm that we didn't have to see, touch, feel, experience? But he didn't. And he didn't because things that are tactile and touchable those are important to him. He wanted to send himself in such a way that he could be reached out and touched, that we could interact with the God of the universe in a way that we never had before, in a way that we wish we could today, physically. Now listen, I'm, I'm a writer, so I understand the importance of words. I understand the importance of touch in ministry. I can write a story and just by changing the nuance of the words or the tense of the word, I can change the whole story. Words have more power than we can even begin to grasp until we reflect in our own lives. So when you study up on these two currencies, words and touch, two things will become very clear to you. Words and touch are important to God but also that words and touch are supernaturally connected. I personally know uh, this, the power of words that are then combined with touch 
When I think back to what it was like for me as a young girl, I was 19 and I knew that God had called me into full-time ministry. So I was going at it in a very serious manner and got rid of all boyfriends, all distractions and said, I'm not dating again until I find the person that God has for me. And until then, I'm gonna focus on school. I'm gonna focus on loving Jesus. And that's the end of that. And my mom said, Jesus help us. She's going to die an old maid. This is not good. So she consistently brought me suggestions of boys that I might want to date, to which I was like, thanks a lot, mom. Thanks, but no thanks. Well, then she goes on this trip and uh, is at a wedding. And let me tell you, my stepdad by trade is a stilt walker, the guy with the long legs and the parade. That's his legit job. And his uncle that we're being connected with is a legit ventriloquist. So they get together and think, we have a solution for Erica's life. <laughs> and I thought, well, well, well. My mom came back from this wedding with the email address that she said, Erica, you've known him a long time, this family we talked about, and, and we think this would be a great idea. He's, this guy's going to school for ministry. You're going to school for ministry. You should at least email him. So I emailed him out of an obligation to love my mother and honor her requests, and it went something like this. Dear Joey, whoever you are, I'm very serious about my faith. I don't play games. I'm going into full-time ministry, and if you're not okay with that, then nice knowing you. I told you I was a natural nurturer, people. <laughs> to which I got an email back that said, sounds like we're on the same page. And I was like, I don't know what to do with this. I scared guys. I don't know why he's all in, but God grew that relationship because he was in Texas and I was in Kansas and our only form of communication was written words. We wrote emails back and forth and back and forth until a month in, he finally asked for my phone number. Now, don't ask me why he didn't ask for that earlier. We were taking things slow. <laughs> so we write, we finally talk on the phone for the first time. Our first phone call was seven hours long. And within the first 15 minutes, I looked at my clock and God said, this is the man that you will marry. It was totally worth the $1,000 phone bill that first month. <laughs> then Joey made plans to come up and visit me in Kansas and made that long eight and a half hour drive. And we had made the bold statement before we ever met, we are not going to kiss or do anything physical for the whole first weekend. We're just gonna get to know each other. So we spent the whole first week, and I think maybe we held hands, and then he was still at my house Sunday night at midnight, and I was like, yo, it's not the weekend anymore. <laughs> we understood in that moment the power of words plus touch, and he put a ring on it, and the rest is history. That was how it worked. God knows that when we put the two things together that he created to build life in us, that it will be explosive. It will be important. It will make a difference. It's not something that we take lightly. God created these things as an example for us to know what it was like to walk with Jesus. I'm gonna list some scripture. If you take notes, feel free to jot them down. I'm gonna go through a lot of them and they won't be on the screens. But Matthew 8, one through three says, when Jesus came down from the mountain, large crowds followed him. A leper came to him and bowed down before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. He said, Jesus touched. Matthew 9, 20 through 22, a woman who had been suffering from a hemorrhage for 12 years came up behind Jesus and touched the hem of his cloak. But Jesus, turning and seeing her, said, daughter, take courage, your faith has made you well. She touched, Jesus said. Words plus touch equals healing. They are supernaturally and almost mathematically connected. God knew that we would need a physical touch and 
tangible words to fill the loneliness that we feel in this world. He knew we would face things that we wouldn't be able to wrap our minds around, and he knew that he wouldn't be here physically to step in the way that he wished he could. So we look at Luke 5, 17. It says, one day Jesus was teaching and the Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem and the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. One of the most important lessons that can be learned from the life of Jesus is that everything he did on this earth was through the power of the Holy Spirit. And when he's in this story, God, in his wisdom, in the written word that he put down for us to follow, made mention that the power of the Lord was on him. The power of the Lord is the Holy Spirit. And what did Jesus tell us about the Holy Spirit? When I leave, I will leave you, but I will send you a helper more powerful than me. He's saying right here, He healed the sick because he had the power of the Lord. How many of us have the power of the Lord? And do we see that when we use our words and we use our touch together, that they bring healing in a way that we can't understand, in the way that I didn't understand, in the way that I sometimes still don't understand? And then some of us run from that because we know how important those words would be to that person. We know how powerful it would be for us to go give that person a hug, pat this one on the back, apologize for that thing. But because we're scared of it, because we put a wall up between us and the voice of the Holy Spirit, us and the power that we have to create healing, we sometimes get stuck. And we don't get to work the way that God intended for us to work. Jesus stepped into the equation of people's lives and brought healing. Their words plus his touch equaled healing. His words, their touch, healing. Your words, my touch, brings healing. What about those who have had a word and touch deficit? What about those that have felt the negative effects of unloving words and unloving touch? What about people who have been told their whole life that they'll never measure up, that they're not good enough, that God doesn't love them, if only they'd work harder, if only they'd run faster, maybe they could earn their way? What about people who never experienced a hug or a loving touch as a kid growing up? What about the people who have been hurt in a more physical abuse with a hand? This is something that I connect with, not in the form of physical abuse, but by the church's hand. Over and over and over again. As Jeremy gets up here to defend the right of women to speak from a platform, it does something inside me. Because like I told you, I've been following Jesus since I was 12 and felt called to the ministry at 14. And there was a young man in our school that was basically my male counterpart. We did all the same things in school. We were in, all, we were in the youth group together. We were in charge of FCA together. Everything was together. But because he was a boy, he got the opportunities. He got the chance to speak. He got the chance to lead. And then when I got married to a man going into ministry. We would introduce ourselves to churches and they would look Joey in the eye and they would shake his hand and they would call him brother and they would act as if I wasn't even standing there. There are churches that we've been hired to to lead worship and speaking and I've been told not to step physically in front of where my husband is on the platform because it's ungodly. I've had my arm grabbed for touching an offering plate when the ushers weren't coming forward when my husband needed them to, and he looked to me and nodded, 
And an elder of the church grabbed my arm and told me that was no place for me to touch that. I've been leading worship, and the moment that my husband stopped talking and I started talking, a woman in the back stood up, stuck her fingers in her ears, and walked out of the room. I had a man in our youth group whose sons were there, and when they found out that I would teach that night, he would come in in front of me and take his sons out, because who is a woman to teach a teenage boy? I have experienced what it's like to have negative touch and negative words from the church, and I know I'm not the only one. I know there are people in this room who have a calling on their life, and the church has not stood up and affirmed that calling in them. Can I share with you that this is the first time in my 36 years of life that a church staff in its entirety has come to me and said, we believe what you have to say is from God and we wanna give you a voice. I have been leading worship and serving in the church since 14 years old. There is something powerful when someone comes in and decides to be the words and the touch of God that someone needs. And here's the great thing is that God is a multiplier. His very essence, his very character is that he multiplies. So we see in Genesis 1-2, God says, be fruitful and multiply. We see in Genesis 22-17, promises to Abraham that his offspring will be too numerous to count. He will multiply them that much. Acts 12-24, the word of God grew and multiplied. 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, Paul says that we are to multiply in others what he has shown us. The very character of God is to multiply. And guess what happens in math when you have a negative multiplied by a negative? Positive outcome. God is the ultimate multiplier, and he will never leave you in the negative, ever. He multiplies, he grows exponentially more than we can ever understand or grasp, and it doesn't make sense. Some of us are intimidated by other people's stories when they say, I've had this negative thing done to me, I've had these words spoken over me, and you think, there's no way. How do they overcome that? How do they continue to work for a church year after year after year that has told them they're not good enough? How do they continue to have a relationship with a father that ignored them over and over and over? How do they continue in that job where no one recognizes what they can bring to the table? And God says, with me, all things are possible, and I am the great multiplier. But here's the thing. He gave us that power. There are some of you in this room, you're the ones who have been affected by the negative words and the negative touch the lack of words, the lack of touch. God wants to multiply in you something that you can't describe or grab onto, but it's powerful. And it will turn all that muck, all the negative, all the lack into something positive. And then some of you in this room have been the cause of the negative and cause of the lack of. And the great news is that there's grace for all of us. There is healing for all of us because God didn't drop us off and leave us without the power to pursue that positive outcome. He sent the Holy Spirit for us, each and every one of us, to grab hold of it. So the question is today, will you say yes? Will you say yes? There are so many opportunities to be the words and the touch, the tangible touch of God, but you still have to say yes. My family has experienced this recently in this adoption that we're following or pursuing. And I remember the first time that God kind of stirred it in my heart, this concept of adoption, and it was a strange prophetic movement, and I couldn't even describe it to my husband, so I didn't, because that'll freak you out real quick (laughs) if you're not ready to hear that. God began to stir it in my heart, and the more I prayed, the more it became evident that he wanted us to say yes to something that we were not at all comfortable with. 
Because here's the deal. I had done all the right things. I had made all the right choices. I uh, got married to a godly man. We had children that were healthy. We had taken all the right steps. We worked for the church. We have no abuse in our family. I've guarded them well. I've guarded them from technology. I've fed them the right foods. My children are great. And God said, hey, uh, can I come right into that? Can I have that right there? And I was like, oh, that's funny. So I'll be praying, I'll pray God for the children that need homes and I'll write some checks if I need to and you will just do your thing. And he said, no, I have a different plan. What if I wanted you to say yes to invite one in to your home, someone who might otherwise experience negative touch and negative words? What if I put them in this comfortable, warm, safe place that you have built with your husband and your kids, would you be willing to be that multiplier? And I've got to be honest, um, I've had a lot of people come to me and say, what you're doing is such a great thing, what a saint. And all I can say is you have no idea how unsaint-like we are to be in this position. Because when God presents you with something that's not an easy yes, it makes it very clear how far from God you are. So one day I'm crying out to God, and, and in, my, in the truth of my story, I just said to God, but this isn't fair. God, I have done all the right things. I have done all the right things. I've made all the right choices. I didn't let my kids go wild and be abused or tossed to the wind or get too hurt. I guarded my marriage. I've worked hard. I've prayed hours. I've worked hard to be where I am in this family and I don't want it messed up, and I don't want to pay for some other woman's sins, her choices. Now I have to reap the benefits? They don't feel like benefits, God. It feels like I'm being punished. And in that broken, honest, vulnerable moment with God, my heart completely exposed, he sweetly whispered to me and said, I love you but don't think that your life is so precious that I won't disrupt it for the sake of another. And it was in that moment that my heart changed. It was in that moment that I began to pray for a mom that I don't even know. I began to get on my knees and cry out for a baby that I don't know as a boy or a girl or when they're due or when they'll be introduced to our family. The mom who didn't even know how to pick up her daughter who fell had grown into a woman that God trusted enough to give an innocent baby to. That is negative times negative equaling a positive because we can't make a way without the Holy Spirit. I would not be adopting without the Holy Spirit. My life would not look the way that it is without the Holy Spirit. I would not be on this platform without the power of the Holy Spirit multiplying in my life. So the question is, will you say yes? Let's all stand. David, if you could come up here. God is telling me that with those two people in the room, those two types of people in the room, and the prayer team as well, we have an opportunity right now. We have an opportunity to let these people on this team be a tangible multiplier in our life. There are some of you that have been hurt by the church. You need someone to come in and pray healing into that. There are some of you who've been hurt by your actual family, by your job. Maybe your life doesn't look anything like you thought it would. Negative after negative after negative. Let this team be a multiplier for you. And then also, some of you were the ones that caused the negative. And there's some repenting that needs to happen. Some of you won't be able to say, please forgive me to the face of the person that you hurt, but we can walk you through that. Because God isn't done with you. 
He doesn't fat, pat you from far away with a broom. There, there. <laughs> He's better than that. And he knows that whatever your deepest need is, he will meet you there. So we're gonna let David play for a moment. I'm gonna pray for us. And if you feel moved to come forward, please do. God, we pray right now for your conviction to land hard, to reveal those hidden parts of our hearts that we have not let others see because we're too ashamed. We're ashamed of the time that we disciplined our kid too rough. We're ashamed to say what was happening to us as a child and we've never told anyone. We're broken by the way the church has treated us or completely overlooked us. God, I pray for healing to fall in this room. God, I pray that our people sitting next to us on either side, God, that they are multipliers. We don't always have to walk to the front. Sometimes the answer is sitting right next to us. Help us have wisdom to know the difference between the two. Be with us. Help us be bold to say yes. Never let us shrink back from the things that are hard because in our weakness, you are made strong and perfect. We give you all the glory for every yes we say. In Jesus' name, amen.